Hey guys, Savage Joy here with Real Progressives. Tonight I am joined again by an amazing PA candidate, Ms. Kristen Seal. Um, she was on back in May, a little before our primaries, and I've had several requests to bring her back. So thank you so much for joining us again, Kristen. Thank you for having me. It's really exciting to be back. Awesome. Well, you guys may remember Kristen. Um, she's amazing. And I always get hyped when I get to interview fellow Pennsylvanians. Yeah. Um, you are running for the House District 168. That's right. um, and uh, there's a lot of history there. In, and in many ways, especially because it's never been held by a woman, which is interesting. And uh, when Sarah Emirato came on my show, she was saying that Pennsylvania has the lowest amount of women elected, period, um, yeah. which is just mind blowing. Um, so what does it mean to you that you could be the first woman to hold this position? I think it's thrilling and I would be so honored to be the first woman. I would also be the first out queer woman in our state legislature ever. So, wow. and yeah, we have nine LGBTQ candidates that made it through their primaries this year in the house. And so we have the opportunity for the first time ever to have more than one out gay elected in our LGBTQ caucus. That's really, really important. That is amazing. Wow. Yeah. It's about time. My word. <laughs> oh my. Yeah. Um, you, you uh, were a Bernie delegate in 2016. Okay. Um, so um, those are my favorite candidates, you guys know. <laughs> um, so was he part of the reason you were inspired to run? Absolutely. I don't think I had ever thought about running for office seriously until I was at the DNC. And it was a lot of the incredible speakers that I got to hear both in caucus and at events and of course on the floor in the evening. Um, all of them were really inspiring. But also as the week went on, um, because we were representing the Pennsylvania delegation, we felt a certain obligation to be good hosts and be friendly to people and have good conversations and help people find things. And um, we would get into conversations with people all week long that would say, well, you're so reasonable. You're not those kind of Bernie delegates. Like, are you going to run for something? And I would just say, no, no, no. I'm here helping my friend who's going to run next year. <laughs> you know, um, I hadn't really thought about it. But I think that during the DNC, there were a lot of delegates from other states that um, were confused by the behavior of some of the Bernie delegates on the floor at night and felt like if they were having a rational and reasonable conversation with somebody that that was really different than what they were seeing on the floor. And there were some people that were really loud, but there were just as many people, regardless of who they were representing, that weren't. And so it was a little strange, um, but it was, it kept leading to the same point was, you're going to run for something, right? And I was like, no. But by the time I got home, I decided that since municipal elections were coming up, I wanted to do something locally to serve my community. Well, you certainly have the background with working with, you know, organizations and, and your mom actually raised you to be an activist. That's so true. do you want to explain a little bit about that, how you got your start? Sure. Um my earliest start in electoral politics was actually because uh, I grew up in Baltimore and my grandparents were Democratic committee people. So um, probably around age four or five, my grandfather was taking me around to the doors to canvas. Um, so it's something that, you know, that sort of retail politics at the doors is not new for me. I've been doing it for a lot of my life. Um, and my mom was just somebody with a real heart for service and volunteering. She felt really strongly that if we had a roof over our heads and had enough to eat, that it was our duty to serve our community. So I grew up volunteering a lot with her in different places um, and, and, you know, started doing service work myself in earnest when I was a teenager, getting engaged in activism. Um, 
And she was always really supportive of that. And sometimes it was work that we did together. One of my fondest recent memories with my mother is she and I taking my daughter to the climate march in Manhattan and um, riding the bus together and spending the day there together. And it was just a really special time for all of us. So I'm happy that this is a tradition in our family and a legacy that I'll pass down to my daughters. Absolutely. So three generations of, of activists, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what do your daughters think about like growing up in, um, you know, in this this way that they get to go to these marches and canvas and things like that? Um, I don't know that they think too much of it. Now that my older daughter is 23 and she's in law school, I think that she thinks it's really cool. Um, but when they're young, it's just, it's what you know, and to whatever degree, like your family is boring and gets on your nerves. So. <laughs> True. I have one daughter that's in high school right now, and I think she's pretty bored of all of the campaign stuff lately. <laughs> <laughs> you actually, um, we met, I, I would say we did our interview about a week before the primary, yeah. um, if not less. It was very close. And I want you guys to take this in because this is a perfect example of why everyone needs to vote. So you, I mean, talk about close. It was 51% to 49%. That's right. And it, it came literally down to the last precinct the very last precinct reporting was the deciding one. And we felt good once it was down to that last precinct because we felt really strongly that one was gonna go our way, but we had no way of knowing. So it was down to the wire. And on election night, I won by 65 votes. They certified the absentee ballots after that. So it's a little more than a hundred that I won by. Yeah, I got 106. <laughs> Yeah, but it's uh, still, this is a situation where every volunteer that knocked a door, every single person that contributed a small amount of money or even a large amount of money or did any work at all on our campaign in the primary got to feel a real sense of ownership of that win because it came down to, you know, less than a hundred people. Wow, that is yeah. too awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so remember that, guys, and tell your friends we're not messing around. Tuesday is something a lot of us have worked on for over a year. Um, so this is, it's a big one. So we definitely got to do our part. That's for damn sure. Um, so how, what has it been like after the primaries for the general? Are you finding a lot of support amongst, are you, you're in a fairly progressive area, which is good. Um, are you fine? Oh, you're not? Yes and no. I live in Media Borough, which in my district is a very progressive area. It's one square mile of sort of, uh, it's like an Austin, Texas in the middle of the rest of my district in my county. So oh. <laughs> um, my district is actually majority Republican and they have a registration oh. advantage. Um, we had a real increase in independent registrations since 2016. There were people that dem exited in our district and there are people that um, abandoned the Republican Party because they felt betrayed as well. So we have an odd mix here where um, Republican and independent votes matter very, very much in this race for me and are a big focus of what we've worked on in Canvas and outreach over the last six months. Yeah. Awesome. And how amazing is it that it doesn't matter what party you are in the general? <laughs> because in the primary, it sure does, unfortunately. Yeah. It's one of the things that we hope to be able to work on in the future is voting modernization for this state. It's it's really clear that the state has done everything to make it difficult to vote. Absolutely. And you do have gerrymandering on your, your platform. What do you think about the redistricting? Do you, we had? Do you think it's advantageous? It's advantageous for congressional candidates, but unfortunately, it hasn't reached the state level yet. So, it matters very, very much um, in Pennsylvania specifically who gets elected this year because we have a census coming up in 2020, and then the maps for the state legislative districts will be redrawn. So it's critical that we start to have more representation in that process. Absolutely. Um, so you actually, um, 
you worked on, um, let's see, you are on a leadership team of a statewide energy um, nonprofit. That's right. Um, can you explain about that and what it is you do? Sure. Um, I am the director of operations at Kia Energy Education Fund. And um, the easiest shorthand is it's a policy organization that um, helped create the energy efficiency law that compels utilities to do a lot of energy conservation work in our state. So um, electric rate payers have enjoyed about $6.4 billion in benefits since 2008, thanks to the conservation work that um, we've been able to do with other organizations, making sure that we are leading in our country. Um, we are a leader in sort of the longest implementation phase of this kind of legislation. And there are lots of other states that have managed to roll back legislation like this through attacks on the law. We've managed to fight that for years and keep it intact from 2008 until now. So we're really proud of that and other policy work that we do statewide to create green energy and clean energy jobs and grow the opportunity for um, a conservation mindset in schools across the state as well. Absolutely. And you also talk about the Mariner East uh, pipeline on your platform. That's a that's a huge thing for us. We've we've got a number of uh, pipelines in PA. In fact, I heard that we are second to Texas, which is oh, pretty terrifying. Yeah. Um, so what what is your stance on on the pipelines we're seeing, and and particularly the Mariner East one? Um, the fight against Mariner East too is something I've been involved in in our area since 2016. Um, there's a wonderful local community group of grassroots bipartisan folks from our neighborhoods. Um, they're called Middletown Coalition for Community Safety. They have a website that you can look up online. There's also a really great blog about what's been happening here in Delaware County called the Dragon Pipe Diaries. Um, Chester County is also involved in this fight. They have had Mariner East construction longer than we have, Mariner East 2 at least. So there's another um, multi-county organization called Del Chesco United for pipeline safety. Um, and, and these small community orgs uh, that have combined their efforts together also work with other communities across the state that are fighting the pipeline. So we've worked all sorts of different strategies on this for years and managed to stop the construction of this pipeline three different times. Um, we got notice two Thursdays ago, two weeks ago today, from Sunoco that they're halting construction or, uh, construction of Mariner East 2 in our area until 2020. And it's partly because, unfortunately, there is a part of the pipeline route that they didn't properly plan for, geologically speaking. So there's a really, you know, there's a neighborhood, a community of apartment buildings called Tunbridge in our area that um, the trial and error horizontal drilling and construction that's gone on to find out that they can't pull a pipeline through that area went on 24 seven for about 76 days, disturbing all of those residents, destroying the property behind their homes, um, only to find that there's just no way that they can run pipeline through there. So. While it sounds like it might be exciting that uh, Mariner East 2 construction is halted, what's actually happening is that they're about to build something that we're calling a Franken pipe. They're taking three old sections of gas pipeline that carries gasoline from Marcus Hook all the way to Reading, Pennsylvania. They have been doing hydrostatic testing on this pipeline or these three sections of pipeline for weeks in our area. Again, weird late night work that breaks local ordinances and disturbs neighborhoods. Um, there, This is a highly compressed natural gas pipeline that carries odorless, colorless gas. Um, it's highly combustible and it's pressurized. And so 
we're not sure how it is that they're going to manage the fact that some parts of this pipeline are eight inches, some are 12 inches, some are 16, um, and specifically the part of the pipeline that goes right past the playground, 650 feet from the playground of an elementary school in my district where I sit on the school board, um, this run of pipe is something that already leaked gallons and gallons of gasoline onto the elementary school property in the 1990s. So um, this is really, Sunoco Energy Transfer Partners is the worst leak record operator in the state of Pennsylvania. They've had numerous permit violations and, and stopped constructions multiple times on this project because they are doing such a poor job of what they're supposed to be doing. Um, they came into our community years ago and said, you'll never know we're here. And it's been, it's been nothing but a nightmare for residents since. So I'm grateful that the Mariner East 2 construction is over, but we are terrified because the Franken pipe is already under the ground. It's a right of way that they already own. That means that we have far fewer avenues for intervention. It's not like we could intervene in construction of something new. Um, there's not a lot of supervision, oversight, or approval for this process. We only have two agencies, one federal and one state, that have any say in this at all. And we won't necessarily know when this pipeline goes into operation. They were saying it might be today. Um, we've heard from one of the oversight authorities that it might not be until the middle or the end of this month. And the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission seemed to indicate that it might be December before it's operational. But I don't know if you heard about the explosion that happened on a Sunoco Energy Transfer Pipeline in uh, Beaver County in Pennsylvania in Western PA. That happened seven days after that new pipeline went into operation. And none of the local municipalities or first responders had been notified that it was operational. So they pretty much consider whenever the federal agency and the local authority um, give them permission to go, that's all the notification they feel like they need to give a community. So we're terrified in part because we won't know when this is operational necessarily. And um, the kinds of accidents that can result from this type of pipeline in the hands of this operator specifically, they're using our community as an experiment that we're not willing participants in. And the the one kind of gas is odorless and colorless? That's right. It's byproducts of fracking in a pure profit pipeline. This isn't fuel. It's being exported from our coast near Philadelphia to Europe for plastics manufacturing. Europeans don't like their plastics to smell. So, wow. We are not going to know that there's a leak most likely until there's a huge gas cloud that someone can see um, or until it finds a source of ignition and it's highly combustible. I can't stress that enough. It won't take much for it to become an explosion. Wow, that is terrifying. Oh my God. We've got a little bit of a different platform than some areas when we're talking about electoral politics. Yeah, I would like to see happen. I think that I uh, missed part of your question. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, what are some of the other green things you would like to see happen? Oh, we have a lot of work to do in this state. Um, we have a constitution that protects our right to our natural environment, but we have done a terrible job of upholding that. Um, there's been a war of attrition on the Department of Environmental Protection for a long time. So I would really like to see the DEP fully funded and staffed. Um, I would like to see a better look at the conditions that provide for a clean energy or an advanced energy economy. I think that we have a lot more opportunity in the state to do work, to move away from fossil fuel extraction, to find sources of energy that are less harmful to our communities and our health, and that create really good living wage jobs in our state. So I think there's 
interesting strategic work to be done that can be beneficial to people in so many different ways if we start looking at what our clean energy economy could look like. Absolutely. And you mentioned living wage. Um, you um, are part of the fight for 15. Um, now, you know, Pennsylvania, I'm not sure, I can't remember if we're 725 or 750, but it's been that way for years. Yeah. It, it's just, it blows your mind. So first, do you think 15 is enough or do you think that should be a step? Okay, so it's kind of like a, a stepping stone. <laughs> It's, you know, on, on the left side of politics, we don't have many good hashtags or catchphrases that stick. Fight for 15 is one that stuck. So yeah. you know, 15 is a good start. Um, it's, it's barely a living wage at 15. So I think that beyond the fight for 15, part of what we need to be looking at is protecting workers' rights and making sure that we're doing everything to create um, optimal conditions for organizing in the workplace, because labor is really at the forefront of protecting all of our rights and safe workplaces and making sure that equity and uh, fair working conditions are things that carry over into other parts of business and industry. Um, so 15 is a great start and something to build from, but there's a lot more work to do in equity in the workplace. Absolutely. Do you support a federal job guarantee? That's a little bit more complex. Yes and no. Um, there are arguments for and against which version of that would be something useful. One thing that I am a really strong supporter of is making sure that we take care of all of the most vulnerable people in our community, whether we're talking about children, elderly people, or people who are medically or otherwise unable to be quote unquote productive. Um, I think that we have human value and a right to human dig dignity in ways that don't intersect with commerce. So I wanna find ways for us to be able to value everyone in a community and support everyone in a community, regardless of their ability to generate profit. Very valid point. Do you, what other things do you see in your um, district? Do you find that housing costs are high? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I myself might have been priced out of buying in my neighborhood in the last five years. We hadn't made a decision about whether to buy in this community or which neighborhood we wanted to buy in. And in the intervening five years, I'm not sure that we will. Um, a conversation that I had not too long ago with uh, my recently retired fire chief and his son, who's the deputy fire chief at the firehouse now, his son lives at home with him because he can't afford to live in this community. And he needs to be close enough to the firehouse that he has a short response time. So his dad's house is a half block north of mine, which makes him less than three minutes from the firehouse anytime there's an emergency. Um, so he's making a sacrifice and living in his family home so that he can make sure that he doesn't delay response to an emergency in our community. There are a lot of folks that volunteer in our local, um, you know, sort of EMT operations and fire stations that can't actually afford to live where they work. So for instance, sometimes in Newtown Square, which is in my district, I meet firefighters that work in other counties and it's a real problem if our police and firefighters and public servants can't live in the community that they serve. So I think that um, one of the things I've always appreciated about Media Borough is that there is mixed income housing here. There are beautiful, large historic homes. There are apartment buildings full of affordable apartments. There are twins and row homes and all sorts of a, a variety of housing stock that I think there are still older folks aging in place, people my age that are middle-aged and young people that live in our community. But as our area gets more and more developed, I think that we're pricing out people that are doing service jobs and public service work. Absolutely. Also have, um, uh, as any progressive should, you have um, universal health care on your platform. 
why is that something you found um, imperative to, you know, campaign for? Sure. Um, Medicare for All is a really big part of my platform. Part of that is because I come from a public health background. So uh, my undergraduate is in public and community health, and I worked on women's health issues in the legislature in New Mexico, as well as for a poverty law center, specifically mostly with the healthcare team on the year leading up to the rollout of the ACA, Obamacare. So we worked really hard on making sure that we got over 300,000 vulnerable people in one of the poorest states in the country enrolled in healthcare. Didn't bankrupt the state, by the way, that Medicaid expansion has saved the state money in emergent care and all sorts of other poorly used resources that should you know, be replaced by preventive care. So um, I think that my work in public health is one of the reasons that I've understood that a great equalizer in communities is health. And in order for us to have healthy communities, we need to have affordable health coverage. Absolutely. Would, would you include um, prescriptions in any kind of plan that you would come up with? Absolutely. <laughs> it's, I, it's part of the reason that Medicare for All is, is my specific version of this. I think that we have absolutely got to um, get this under control, make sure that people, whether we're talking about young people or seniors, can afford their prescriptions and don't have to make choices in their budgets based on whether or not they're going to take care of their health or keep a roof over their heads or eat or anything else. I think that more and more families are struggling and sometimes health is not at the top of people's lists, but the effects that that can have on the health and lives of a community when you have large numbers of people that aren't able to receive the kind of care that they need, it can be devastating. Absolutely. What, um, as far as your, your area, um, what, when you go canvassing and, and phone banking and stuff, what are the things you hear the most as people's concerns? Healthcare is top of the list. That turns out to be our top ranked message at the doors, especially. Um, even if someone is well off and has good health coverage, every single person we've talked to has a family member or a loved one, somebody that they know that has really struggled because of our healthcare system. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's very universal at this point, And it's a message that people are really responding to, even where they have health coverage. Um, it's not so simple. My family specifically, we have a $60 copay for almost every doctor visit. So if anyone ever needs more than just sort of regular checkups that are covered by the plan, that starts to get really expensive really fast if you're a middle income family. Um, even those of us that are fortunate enough to have quote unquote good health care still struggle and, and still spend quite a lot of money on things like doctor visits and prescriptions. Yeah, absolutely. I've, oh, in the past two months, I've found that out all too well. When, uh, one of my viewers set me up a, a GoFundMe because I started, I ended up in emergency surgery and all this stuff. And I was just like, I have good health insurance. Why? why is this happening? And then I went legally blind and all this shit happened. And I'm like, like all at once. So it's like, and I have good health care. And yeah. I know there that that story's not original. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's like, it, I mean, you see this all over. And that's, that makes me so happy that people are showing empathy that even if they, you know, have good health insurance themselves, that they still want it. It's, it's become a household term, you know, this Medicare for all, which is pretty awesome. Um, yeah, I'm really happy about that. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I think we'd all be much happier. In fact, I've seen studies that show that the de depression rate would just like deplete. Um, it would help people out so much. Um, the work that we did on the ground in public health in New Mexico was educating people about medical debt and where and how they could get indigent care. And, you know, we were teaching people things like if it's not a major emergency, take a taxi instead of an ambulance because it's the only Absolutely. thing that's not covered by care. I think it's a really sad day 
when you have to do a lot of groundwork and outreach explaining to people how they can avoid debt if they have a medical emergency. Absolutely. I just took an Uber to the ER. I, I totally understand. It's crazy. And, and when I told the Uber driver that I was going to the hospital, he was like, are you okay? I was like, yeah, I'm well, fine. Going to visit someone. Oh, I'm okay. <laughs> What's that? Is it everything's great? Hurry up, please. <laughs> everything's going to just step on it. <laughs> um, so you, uh, let's see, PA is 46th in state share of public education funding. Uh, I got that from your website. Can you explain more on that? Sure. So we are right now at an historic all-time low in Pennsylvania for the percentage of the total cost of education that the state funds in our public schools. It used to be a lot closer to 50, and now we are at, at the current time, it's 37% of the total cost of education. So what that means is... Um, there's 9% of our budget in my school district that we get from the federal government, which is largely used towards or given to us for um, taking care of the costs for special needs children that we're constitutionally obligated, not just to educate, but to care for. And so we, the cost of that care and the population of children that we serve that are in that situation is growing at a high and, and, and sort of faster rate than the Act One index in Pennsylvania. So we often have outsized costs that we're not receiving funding um, and a lot of unfunded mandates that are burdens on school districts from the state. There's quite a lot of legislation that gets passed that requires schools to do things that cost money, school districts, um, without a funding stream for that. So the net result is that between that and our conservative sort of Republican supermajority legislature choking off almost every revenue stream that we have to fund schools, what's left is one that's sustainable and consistent and that's property tax. So homeowners are who are really covering the majority of our school funding. And in a lot of districts, part of what's covering their budget is loans. We're financing away our future in many, many districts just to keep things on the rails and meet the costs of running schools. So we're in a real bind statewide. And it's in one case, you know, the reason, for instance, that my school district might have grabbed at a settlement and, uh, you know, money for an easement that they sold to Sunoco, which is now putting elementary school kids in danger they had a budget deficit and they were being offered money and not really told the truth about what it was about. And so when we impoverish schools and districts in this way, statewide, desperate times call for desperate measures. Who knows what kind of funding people will reach out and take just so that they can make sure that the schools stay operational. Um, in addition, we don't have a working fair funding formula. It's only applied to new monies in the state right now, and it needs to be unilaterally applied to all money in the state. But unfortunately, that formula, if applied unilaterally without adequate funding from the state for schools, is going to result in taking from wealthier districts and giving to less resource districts. And that's going to create a really serious problem in our state. So I think that these two things go hand in hand. We have to adequately fund our schools. We have to adequately fund them with sustainable revenue streams that are going to bring us, you know, revenues that we can depend on and, and make sure that we are not, um, by default, hurting property owners and taxpayers, homeowners, in the process of trying to make sure that we have good public schools. Absolutely. Um, something that, uh, what do you tell people when they're like, my vote doesn't count? What's the point? It doesn't matter. Um, Cause there's, you know, a lot of us feel that way sometimes only for a day. Um, but 
um, how do you convince them that we we just need to vote? Um, I think that my primary results are really convincing for a lot of people. Good point. <laughs> yeah, especially if I'm at a speaking engagement in a room with about the same number of people, it's really easy to visualize what 65 people looks like and how easy it would be for someone to vote or not vote and make a difference in that particular race. Um, I think that it's less hard to convince people this year. I, at least anecdotally, me personally, I've had a lot of conversations with people that have not turned out for anything but a presidential. And even during the presidential, maybe they only hit that top ticket button and then they walk out of the voting booth. Um, so I'm personally seeing a lot of people that are far more motivated to vote in the midterm than they've ever been before. And I'm seeing that regardless of party affiliation. I've had so many interesting conversations with Republican women this year. They are really fired up. And in a lot of cases in my district, they're fired up to vote Democrat. Um, so it's been, it's been really interesting. The place I have a harder time convincing people is on college campuses. Sometimes it is really hard to, you know, what young people now are inheriting from us as their burden going into their adult lives and, and adult work lives is really ridiculous. We, we have really failed the generations right behind mine. And so um, the best that I can do is acknowledge the fact that my generation in part, Gen X, really let them down that some of us are aware and we're working as hard as we can to try to fix the problem, but that there's no future for any of this in politics without them, not just voting and being engaged as volunteers or supporters, but um, there's a real gap between the boomers and the millennials, for instance, um, of people in my generation that are running for office. So, and we're a smaller generation to start with. Um, if we don't have people that are under the age of 30 really stepping into politics and claiming it as their own right now, what happens when all the boomers pass away or retire and move to another state? We'll have no party. Who will staff the polls? <laughs> you know, it's, it's absolutely right now, this very moment, your time. If you are between the ages of 18 and 30, now is your time. It's not wait 10 years. It's not wait 15. It's not wait until you're more established because your economic prospects are kind of bleak. So <laughs> you might as well go ahead and join the fight right now. And I think it's, it's, if young people get really engaged right now, I think it can have a really strong impact on leveling some of the dramatically dismal prospects of their future. Absolutely. I mean, I still pass for a millennial, but I'm nowhere near it. <laughs> but I have a lot of candidates say, you people really impress me by getting into fall. I'm like, um, six months, I'll be 40. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. The younger people are absolutely in some states, you can even vote when you're 17, which is amazing. So yeah. definitely, even if you can't vote, we all need to be involved. Um, another good, uh, example I've used for months is Bernie won as mayor for, by 10 votes. I oh, mean, yeah. <laughs> like, Bernie wouldn't be Bernie if 10 people, <laughs> if 11 people didn't vote. Sure. And it's way harder to get to a polling place in November in Vermont than it is in Pennsylvania. Yes. So you hear that you guys, if they can do it, please. <laughs> um, so if there's something you want to leave our viewers with so that they send um, your website or the show or any information to people in Pennsylvania to get the word out, what do you want them to take away? Hmm. I, the strongest <laughs> message that I would really like for everyone to take away is get engaged and participate and especially please consider running Next year in Pennsylvania, there will be just hundreds of municipal seats that are up 
And I think, you know, at any level that you feel like you can engage and, and maybe run for a local municipal office to effect change in your community or help keep your community great if it's already great, um, it's your time. I really want everyone to consider engaging with their local party, volunteering on campaigns, but especially run. That's awesome. Well, you have a lot of love in the comments. I definitely want you to uh, check them out um, afterwards. There's some PA people in there definitely appreciating you. So you guys, all everyone that's feeling this, regardless of your state, share it so that we can get the word out. Um, these, these socialists are really doing something good. <laughs> that dirty S word. Um, <laughs> But thank you so much for coming back. I really appreciate it. You, I mean, the audience absolutely adores you. I've had so many requests to come for you to come back. Um, I appreciate it. I appreciate your support, everybody. Kind words mean a lot right now. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, I am rooting for you. All of these guys are too. Um, I, I think we're got we're good. I think we really got this. Honestly, I am so. For the first time, I'm like proud to be a Pennsylvanian because like we have several good progressive women like burners. Like we have good people like who support us and who run for us now. So mm -hmm. this is an exciting time. And like I said, I'm in Harrisburg area. As soon as you get to Harrisburg, drinks on me. <laughs> Absolutely. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Best of luck. And thank you guys for watching. I have two more candidates tonight. Or awesome. I, just, I just did two today and I work full time. I meant two tomorrow. Thank you for everything you're doing. That's great. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Much love. Bye. Bye-bye.